right, well, good morning. We're going to go ahead and get started here. Uh, I don't have too many announcements this morning. Um, the only ones I have are uh, continue to pray for Sue Goodman, continue to pray for Don Ash family. Um, and Pam mentioned something this morning that might be a good idea. She said that uh, just this week, if you want to, if you can think of someone, maybe check on them, give them a call, either a church family member or someone else in your life. Uh, just it's kind of a nice thing. Uh, it was several weeks ago, Mark called me and just asked how I was doing and everything. It really did make a difference. Um, you know, that someone was thinking of me. Um, uh, the only other, yeah, no, don't do that. I don't, no. Um, the only other announcement I really have is, um, you know, today the weather's a little cooler, a little rainier, but they wanted me to say that the first person who complains, because we had all these hot, hot days where every time I stood up, it just sweats right now. The first person that complains, Mark's going to come around just real hard while he's wearing baseball cleats, okay? So um, no complaining, but let's go ahead and start with a prayer. Father in heaven, we're thankful. Uh, for everything you bless us with. Father, we want to be a family that's thankful in all situations, in all times. Father, we want to just keep in mind that the reason we're thankful is not because of conditions on this earth, but that because of Jesus, we get to look forward to eternal life with you in heaven. Father, just during the hard times we face in this life, just help us to keep that in the focus. And help our focus this morning be on worshiping you with the songs we sing, the lesson that's brought to, to us, and uh, when we remember Jesus' sacrifice when we take communion today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have a song book, uh, first song will be number 72, I Know That My Redeemer Lives. I know that my Redeemer lives and ever prays for me. I know eternal life He gives from sin and sorrow free. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal life He gives. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that over yonder stands a place prepared for me. A home, a house not made with hands, most wonderful to see. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal life He gives. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. Morning, family. Will you pray with me? Holy Father, heart in heaven, most holy is your name. You are our ruler, our God, our king. You are our life, you are all in all. We are so honored that you are here in our presence today. And Father, today we want to acknowledge you as it says in Psalms 119. You're our shield, you're our refuge, and it's in your word that we find our hope. And as we come upon different circumstances and difficulties in life today, we know that we do not have to fear because we have the truth. We have your word. We know you're in control and that you love us. We pray, Father, that you'll be with all your children throughout the world at this time. Bless them. Keep them safe. Help us, Father, to be more like Jesus, mold us into his image, so we can love as he loves, so we can forgive as he forgives, so we can give the word as he gave the word. 
We have the truth within us, and we need to share that with the world. Be with us, Father. We know that there are those among us who are sick and need our prayers. There are those among us who have lost loved ones and need our prayers. There's those who've had surgeries, and as they recover, they need your help and your strength. Well, Father, we need you at all times and all ways. You truly are our refuge and our shield. It's in Jesus' blessed name that we pray. Amen. Song before communion will be number 134. 134. Off we come together. <clears throat> Oft we come together. Oft we sing and pray. Here we bring our offering on this holy day. Help us, Lord, thy love to see. May we all in truth and spirit worship thee. May we keep in memory all that thou hast said. May we truly worship as we eat the bread. Help us, Lord, thy love to see. Spirit worship thee. May we all in spirit, all with one accord, take this cup of blessing given by the Lord. Help us, Lord, thy love. Spirit worship Thee. Good morning. many of you know I'm not a young man anymore. I hate to admit that. But when I look back, you know, at, at uh, growing up in the church, I got a lot of stories. I'll spare you most of them today. One of them, though, was is it seemed like every year we'd have at least one sermon on the horrific nature of Christ's death. They dwell on the details of the cat and nine tails used to flog Jesus and how it would tear the, the skin off your back and how he was marched around between uh, different places and how he's forced to carry his cross and how the suffering on the cross uh, included suffocation and it just go into great gory detail and everyone squirming and you know I, I don't want to knock those kinds of sermons because they're very useful particularly when you you know the debt that you owe after you hear one of those sermons but many times we forget that the the real important thing about that death was not the fact that he was killed and he died and we owe a lot to Christ. We owe everything to Christ for that death. The big thing is, is he's no longer dead. He's still alive. He came back to life just as was predicted thousands of years before he was born, just as was predicted by the prophets. And as he predicted, he said, give me it when the Pharisee said, give me a sign. And he said, okay tear down this temple, I'll rebuild it in three days. They thought he meant literally the temple. What was he talking about? He was talking about himself, about his uh, body being risen. So, you know, there's value in saying that we owe Christ an awful lot for what he did for us in his death, but we also owe him an awful lot because he has been raised and we have something to look forward to. 
So we need to be thinking about the resurrection. In fact, when Christ, or when Paul wrote to the Corinthians about how to do the Lord's Supper correctly because they had forgotten, he also had to deal with the fact that some of them had forgotten there is a resurrection. He wrote these things in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. He was buried and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas, then the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and then to the apostles. And last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as dead, for, as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection? If there's no resurrection from the dead, then not even Christ was raised. And if Christ was not raised, then our preaching is vain and your faith is in vain. For if the dead are not raised, or I tell you, brother, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all be, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. And the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed for this perishable body must put on the imperishable and this mortal body must put on mortality. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always bounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord, your labor is not in vain. So we need to think not only of the horrific death of Christ, we need to think of that great glory that we can look forward to someday. Let us bow as we take the bread. Father in heaven, we're thankful for what you were willing to do to allow your son to die on that cross for us. Help us to remember that body that was given for us as we eat this bread. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Father, at this time, as we partake of the fruit of the vine, help us to remember the blood that flowed on Calvary. Help us just to be grateful for that contribution to us, that, that great gift that allows us to once again see you, to see those that have gone before us again in heaven. We ask you to help us to be motivated for this week to live for you and to do good works. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Our next song will be number 279, Give Me the Bible. This will be the song before Mark's lesson. <laughs> Give me the Bible, it's gleaming. Hold on just a second. I've got to get this adjusted because the wind just picked up. All right, let's try this again. Give me the Bible, star of gladness gleaming, to cheer the wanderer, alone and tempest-tossed. No storm can hide that radiance peaceful beaming, since Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Give me the Bible, holy message shining, thy light shall guide me in the narrow way. 
Precept and promise, law and love combining, till night shall vanish in eternal day. Give me the Bible when my heart is broken, when sin and grief have filled my soul with fear. Give me the precious words of Jesus spoken, hold up my flame and show my Savior's near. Give me the Bible, holy message shining, thy light shall guide me in the narrow Precept and promise, law and love combining, till night shall end all day. Give me the Bible, lamp of life immortal, hold up the splendor by the open grave. Show me the light from heaven's shining portal, show me the glory gilding Jordan's wave. Give me the Bible, holy message shining. Thy light shall guide me in the narrow way. Precept and promise, love and love combining, till night shall vanish in eternal day. One of the uh, passages I've always been fascinated by and intrigued by is Isaiah chapter 14. That, along with another text from the prophets, which is Ezekiel chapter 28, it's often been cited as having something to say about where Satan came from, our great enemy. And so, for that reason, others have always been interested in this chapter. And if you want to look there with me for a few minutes, chapter 14 of Isaiah. You know, if you've read through the prophets, you know that often in them you'll find sections where there's these, these oracles from God that are directed against the nations that were the enemies of Israel and uh, surrounded Israel and so forth. And they were oracles of judgment against these nations. Um, Nations like Syria and Edom and Moab and so forth, just a common thing in the prophets. And then God would start in on his people after he spoke to the nations. Well, that is going on in this section of Isaiah as you come to chapter 14. And there's a message there, an oracle against the great nation of Babylon. Babylon being the great superpower of the time and very proud of their status in the world. And Isaiah 14, then, is a taunt uh, the nation of Babylon against, in particular, its king. A taunt uh, being sort of a fancy way of describing trash talk. So God, in this article, is putting Babylon in its place, especially Babylon's king, cutting them down to size, giving them a much-needed humbling. Isn't that something that we all need from time to time? Humbled. Shake your head this way. Uh, there are a lot of people, a lot of governments, a lot of leaders, celebrities, uh, famous people who need humbled in our day, aren't there? Well, this here in this ancient text, we see God humbling one of the greats of Isaiah's time. And you'll notice at the beginning of this chapter about verse 3, verse 3 and 4, the taunt begins. God says to the prophet Isaiah, you will take up this taunt against the king of Babylon. Then it goes on in verse, uh, really down through verse 11, describing how the king, the great king of Babylon has been brought low and all the, the earth rejoices because of this. And and so forth, and, and sort of in poetic language, it says the king has died, he's been brought down to the place of the dead, which they called Sheol, and basically he's become food for worms and maggots. It's pretty graphic language. 
And we're going to pick up in verse 12 of Isaiah 14 and read through verse 17, where it says this, How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. Above the stars of God, I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to Sheol, to the far reaches of the pit. Those who see you will stare at you and ponder over you. Is this the man who made the earth tremble? Who shook kingdom, world like a desert, and overthrew its cities? Who did not let the pris his prisoners go home? And then it just goes on like that uh, for the next several verses. You hear the taunt in that, I hope, against the Babylonian king. How you are fallen, how you are brought low. You who were once so powerful, so exalted, and the question is asked in sort of a mocking tone, is this the person that everyone was afraid of? Is this pitiful wretch, the one who made knees knock and teeth chatter all over the world? See, the king has been humbled by God, brought down from his lofty heights, knocked down a peg or two, Something, again, that a lot of people need, and I'm sure we all need from time to time. But why was it needed? Why did it happen? Because of pride. I want you to take special note, again, what the king of Babylon himself says in these verses, in verses 13 and 14. This is what he said in his heart, and, and no doubt he spoke these words in some form or fashion. He says... I will ascend to heaven. Above the stars of God, I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. You hear the repetition? I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. Five times. In two verses, the king says in his great pride, I will. And God says in response, uh, no, you won't. And it's what he says he will do, the king. It's really most shocking. He, basically, he says he's going to make himself greater than God. He's going to make himself greater than the great one higher than the most high. He's going to shoot up to heaven and set himself up a throne. I will do this, he says. God says, no, you won't. Anytime man says, I am the greatest, it's time for a humbling. Anytime a person, in essence, puts themselves on the level of God, a crushing reality is on its way. Even if you're king of the greatest nation on earth, there is still one who is so far above you, it cannot be calculated. Everyone, no matter how great they think they are, no matter who they are, how independent, they, they believe themselves to be, how proud they are, will answer to the Most High God. And anytime we hear ourselves saying, I will, too much, we ought to remember this passage and recall the one that, that we answer to. Well, to make more impact, I want to contrast this with one other passage. It's 
It's Matthew chapter 26. In Matthew 26, the son of the Most High God, we see Jesus, the Messiah. Now, here's one who can truly say that he has a throne in heaven. Right, right, to, to claim divinity, to claim all power and privilege. If, if anyone ever had a right to be prideful, it was he. If anyone could plausibly use the words, I will, I will do this, I will do that, it would be the Lord. But imagine we find Jesus in the garden just before he's arrested unjustly, just before he's bound in chains and, and before he's taken to, to that mockery of a trial and he's tortured and hung on a cross. We find Jesus before all of these awful trials preparing himself for it in prayer. You remember, remember the scene in, in Matthew 26? Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. He said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples, found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, So could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will. Again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Could the contrast be any greater? You see the point. I will versus thy will. Jesus, the Son of God, who had every right and every privilege and power to say, I will, instead said, thy will be done. Not as I will but as you will, thy will, thy will, thy will. Three times Jesus says this in the garden when he prayed, not my will, but thy will. Five times the proud king said, I will. Three times the true king of kings says, thy will. Whose example do you follow more closely in your daily walk? Whose words do you ape as you go about your life? What do you hear yourself saying more, whether it's out loud or in your heart? I will or thy will. It's really a simple question today, but it's so important. And the answer to it tells us, tells you and me who really sits on the throne of our hearts. The God of heaven or self. If anyone other than the God of heaven sits on the throne of your heart, a great humbling is on its way.
just like happened to this king in Babylon. But if, on the other hand, God truly sits on the throne of your heart, Jesus is your Lord, then the Most High will one day say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of your Lord. It is a choice that we make each day. My will, let's pray. Great God, we want you to be the one that rules our life. Help us to learn to pray the prayer your son prayed, thy will be done. Thank you for his example. And thank you for his life, death, and resurrection for us. We pray. Amen. Thank you for listening. Our final song will be number 567. There's a great day coming. We'll sing the first two verses. There's a great day coming, a great day coming. There's a great day coming by and by. When the saints and the sinners shall be parted right and left. Are you ready for the day to come? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? There's a bright day coming, a bright day coming. There's a bright day coming by and by. But its brightness shall only come to them that love the Lord. Are you ready for the day to come? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? If you'd all bow with me. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this day, for the opportunity that we get to come together and worship you. We pray that our worship to you is uh, pleasing in your sight. Pray, God, that you watch over us this morning, help us to grow as people and to grow as Christians. And we want to thank you so much for the sacrifice that your son made. And in your son's name we pray. Thank <laughs> you.